macOS Sequoia comes with a bunch of great new features and enhancements, including new wallpapers, iPhone mirroring, there's updates to the camera, notes, Safari, and a whole lot more. It was announced at the beginning of June at WWDC, and now that we're into July and through a couple of months of beta versions, I've been able to actually check out a lot of these new features and dig into how a lot of them work and what they have to offer. Some are likely going to be very useful, some not so much depending on who you are. So today I want to go over not only how these features currently work, but how you can set them up or tweak them as well. So if you're curious about macOS Sequoia, maybe you're considering installing a beta version, or if you're watching this a few months from now and you're wondering if it's worth installing, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. When Apple showed off macOS Sequoia at WWDC, I'd argue that it was one of the biggest updates in terms of new features that we've seen over the last couple of years. There's, of course, all the new AI stuff. We're likely not going to see a lot of that for quite some time, even after Sequoia is out of beta. And we're going to go over some of what will be showing up pertaining to AI in a bit. But let's just start off with the more tangible things that we can play around with right now. First on the list is my personal favorite in this year's release, iPhone mirroring. This, like the name suggests, lets you look on your phone screen without having to physically pick up your phone and interact with it which is going to be enormously helpful for a lot of people. Just a note here that not only do you have to be on macOS Sequoia for this to run, you'll also have to have iOS 18 installed. But once you've done that, all you have to do to set this up if it's not already in your dock is either go to Launchpad or Spotlight Search and go into iPhone mirroring. From there, you should get this little pop-up that tells you what you're getting yourself into and you can click continue. And once we've done that, there's a message on the Mac saying that you've got to unlock your iPhone to use it on this Mac. So I can do that and that should be all you need to do to see your phone screen on your Mac. From there, you'll get a message asking if you want to authenticate automatically, which I'm going to do. And after that, you can navigate around on your phone just like you would if it was in your hand. You can go into apps and everything should behave exactly the same as you'd expect. As you can see, you can move that phone display anywhere on your screen and you'll notice that you've got a couple little icons at the top. One of these currently doesn't do anything, but the other one opens up my app drawer, which is kind of handy. And you'll notice that while I'm doing this, my iPhone will stay locked and you can't see anything on its screen. Not only can you navigate through your phone and your apps, but you can also receive all your notifications from your phone to your Mac, which I really like. And to turn that off or on, you can head into settings and under notifications, there's a toggle to allow iPhone notifications. There's still some features that we don't currently have that are coming at a later date, like dragging and dropping files between your iPhone and your Mac that I think are going to be super handy as well. But even as it stands right now, iPhone mirroring is super useful. Moving on to the second thing, which I've wanted to see in macOS natively for years, but was just added is window snapping. When I moved from Windows to Mac years ago, one thing that I really missed was the ability to snap different windows to different parts of my screen. And for years, I used a third party tool called Magnet to do that. Now I no longer have to bother with that as you can just natively use window snapping in a variety of different ways. You can do this by just dragging your window to different edges of the screen where an overlay will tell you exactly where the window will go. You can also hold the option key down as you're moving the window to do something similar or you can hold down or hover on the green sizing button in the upper left to manually select a placement. If you're doing this for the first time, you might notice that we've got a little margin around the window and maybe you'd rather have that window take up the full area that was previewed. You can adjust this if you head into settings under desktop and dock and go to windows and you can check disable tiled windows have margins. It's not going to add a huge amount of space, but it is nice to have the option nonetheless. With that out of the way, let's say that you want to present one of these windows in a FaceTime or a Zoom call. macOS has a new presenter preview option that allows you to select and show what you'll share before showing it to everyone. I'm sure if you've been on enough calls with people sharing their screen, you've probably seen some embarrassing Google searches at the very least. So this is a nice step added to make sure that you're sharing what you want to share. 
To see this in action, while you're in a call, you can click on the presentation icon and from there you can now select which window that you want to share. And you'll see you get a little prompt asking if you want to share this window or all the windows here as opposed to just sharing everything. Within that little camera menu, you'll also notice that you have some more background options if you want to swap out your background to an image and your portrait settings will adjust how blurred that image will be. I know that most meeting apps have similar features to this, but it is nice to have that in a native control in one place. So you can just set it here rather than in different places on each platform. Moving on to Safari, most of the big changes there are located in the little icon to the left in the address bar where you'd normally find the reader and that will bring up something called highlights. Highlights will show you helpful information and suggestions based on the content of the page that you're viewing. So things like maps, directions, links to media or people or summaries of that content. Unfortunately, I think a lot of that functionality is currently limited to the US in the beta and I don't have access to that yet, but there are a few things that I was able to look at within here. One is the newly redesigned reader where you can adjust fonts and colors and you'll eventually be able to see a table of contents and a summary of the content here as well. Safari also has more advanced video recognition within the viewer where as a video is detected on the page, you can click on the viewer button to bring it into more of a distraction free view and the video will automatically move into picture in picture if you click away from it. If you've ever used the pop out feature in Firefox, this feels quite similar to that, but I think all these reader and highlight features will end up being quite valuable. Chances are, regardless of what browser you're using, you probably have some kind of password management, whether that's just keychain access or a third party manager like 1Password or LastPass. But new this here is a standalone passwords app that is not only available on macOS, but all Apple operating systems and even on Windows as well. Now, this is still basically keychain access under the hood. It's just been pulled into its own app and it's a little more user friendly and viewable. Within here, you can see and manage all your password information and you can now share it with your family and friends. I'm likely just going to get rid of my third party password app when all of this stuff gets out of beta and just go with this, especially since we'll have support on Windows. And the nice thing is, is you can actually import all of your passwords from those third party tools right inside of here, either when you start the app for the first time or by going to file and import passwords. Another simple yet effective app that I use every day is Notes, where there's also been some notable updates. You can now add voice memos with transcription right inside of your notes. All you need to do is click this little sound wave icon in the menu bar within a note and you'll see your voice memo window pop up on the right hand side. And if all you want to do is record a memo, you can just do that and it'll place it within the note. Another feature that's coming, which I don't currently have access to, but I have seen some other folks using is transcription, where you can click the transcribe button that will be just to the left of the record button, and that should transcribe as it records. I'm assuming that is also currently limited to the USA in beta, but I use these kinds of features quite a bit to be honest. I actually recorded WWDC on my Samsung S24 Ultra while I was watching it and transcribed that, just so I could have a quick, easy to access summary of the event in text for my own use, so really happy to see that show up in here. With that said, probably one of the coolest things in here though is the introduction of math notes. Anytime you start putting math within a note and you put an equal sign following something like 420 times 69. It'll give you the result and this works with formulas and variables as well, which is kind of cool and probably really useful if you're a student. There's also some less impactful but still beneficial features with text styles where you can highlight text within the text style button just like iOS or you can create heading text that will give you collapsible sections with a little drop down arrow, which just helps you keep things a little more organized. The Messages app has new text style updates as well, where you can now add bold, italic, underline, or strike through options to highlight a text by right clicking or option clicking on it. And you can now add animation to it as well within the text styles option in that menu, which is kind of neat. There's also new reaction options within tap backs, where instead of just having the few options you had before, you can now select any emoji that you want and eventually you'll be able to generate your own, which we'll get into in just a minute. But if you're someone like me who talks to people all over the world between family and work, you can now schedule messages in advance by hitting the plus icon beside your message and clicking send later. 
The last thing that I'd say that most people will probably touch on a semi-regular basis that we can see right now in macOS Sequoia are the new wallpapers, where you've got the standard Sequoia one with a little lock screen animation. I'm actually not really a fan of this one personally, but they also have these retro Mac dynamic wallpapers that I think are super cool and I much prefer. That about does it for the things that we can touch right now, at least for the things I think are worth mentioning, and a lot of the more notable or flashy features that we saw at WWDC won't even show up in beta until the fall. So realistically, you're not going to see those in a production release probably until the end of the year or early next year minimum, but I think they're worth briefly mentioning. Like I said with tap backs and just with messages in general, you'll now be able to generate your own emojis based on prompts or suggestions or even based on people in your image library. That expands even further with the image playground where there's supposed to be a standalone app for image generation again where you can use prompts or suggestions to make an image, or you can use it right inside of apps like Freeform and Notes by circling sketches or empty areas where you want an image placed. You'll also get a bunch of other AI goodies with text where you can summarize blocks of written text, proofread documents, and rewrite or change the tone of a document or message. I'd say the thing that people will probably be the most excited for, provided it works, is Siri is also supposed to be much smarter and will be able to understand context a lot better. So if you ask it to do one thing, like check the weather for a specific location, and then follow it up by just saying, give me the directions there. It'll be able to link what you said previously to your current message. Siri will also be able to understand to do OS level commands, like tell you how to do things within your settings or do things for you within the OS or within apps, which is very cool. And most of this will be done locally on your machine or via private cloud compute to make sure everything is private without collecting any personal information. For anything outside of what Apple covers, there will be third-party integrations like ChatGPT, which from what I understand will be turned off by default, and you'll have to manually turn those on. And I think as this stuff comes out in the fall and beta, I'll likely make a follow-up video to this one, going over all that stuff as well. That being said, even without all the AI features, there's still a ton of useful functionality within macOS Sequoia and definitely a couple of things that I'll be using daily. I am kind of curious to know how many of these features everyone else will end up using, so please drop a comment down below and let me know what you like the most out of everything here, or if there's anything that I missed that you feel like should be mentioned. That's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video or you found it useful. If you did, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech-related content or help me create a Roomba that hides from you and sends you clues about its location, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.